so yeah, this is the final date for the tour for you guys. Yeah, um, yeah. We were just sort of saying a moment ago how um, just fantastic and fun. And I think what I love about these bills is that there's kind of every angle of the punk spectrum ticked off. Yeah, yeah. If not represented on stage, definitely represented in the entire package with everyone from the crew to uh, to the bands, you know, and just the personalities that are out here. I mean, we really do. I think when you when you look at the whole package, we we have uh, a you know from punk to ska, to emo, hardcore. Uh, everybody, it's sort of like this representation of all these misfits put together, which to me, that's punk rock. You know, that was what drew me into punk rock. How does something like this compare with, and you know, this is obviously a fraction of what the Warp Tour is in terms of like time, scale, uh, but how does something like that compare to, you know, this tour in terms of the behind the scenes operation? Is that as you'd expect it to be? Is it kind of a a community i mean you obviously did it this year as well right and you've been doing it yeah i mean years. warp tour really is unlike any other tour and that you really only find out what time you're going to be on stage that morning because they do like a lucky dip thing right yeah they just continuously change it every day and the goal of that is to get people to come to the show early so that they'll watch every band instead of just saying like oh i want to see a band that's on at five o'clock i'm going to get there at four thirty. And and it works. I mean, in that respect, I think that so there, what Warped Tour no does is unique. In the sense that... There are headliners in the sense that there is a main stage and the headliners are going to be on that stage. But when you're on Warped Tour, no matter how big your band is, you will play first one day. So it doesn't matter who you are. That's you're, unique. You're gonna, it? it is. Cool. It is. It's really cool. I mean, I think that's one thing about Warped Tour I really like. As far as like the backstage and the camaraderie, that kind of thing... I think the Warped Tour is just like any other tour. I mean, if you, you know, I think people in bands generally tend to attract to each other. I think our lives are very similar. We can relate to the kind of things that we all go through that people who aren't in touring bands don't go through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like, you know, if you're a plumber, you relate to other plumbers. If you're an accountant, you relate to other accountants. I mean, it's you're a crazy in- lifestyle, man. And, um, you know, for me as a DJ doing it on my own, you don't have that same sense of like a team with you. Yeah. But like yeah. there's something very almost piratey about being on tour you kind of breeze into town <sighs> yeah yeah raise hell you get out and then it's on to the next and yep. it's it's, it's a, such a unique crazy existence that well, isn't for the faint of heart is it it's not for the faint of heart but nothing stops it you know like i've had a cold this whole time i mean i've seen people walk out on stage practically hacking up a lung like pretty much <laughs> dying yeah. you know but you still do it and and the i've show been must go on right? the show must go on i mean it's it's one of those things where and and sometimes it's self-inflicted i mean sometimes you're out partying the night before and it's as you crack a beer as very apropos beer right very <laughs> apropos but it's um and it's and it's one of those things that even um you know on a tour like this where we're getting out of the venue at about twelve thirty one in the morning. That's about the time we're packed up. We're driving about an hour and a half. We're checking into a hotel. We're sleeping for four hours. We're getting up. We're driving another two or three hours and get here in time for sound check at one thirty. So, you know, we've been averaging four or five hours of sleep a night. And then you just go do your day and you do the show. And it's um, it's a pretty savage existence in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, the the, the glamour of it is not... I, I think what a lot of people think it is. Um, and then there are other tours where we do it in a bus and it's a lot nicer and it's a lot easier. I'm not complaining. You know, I chose this lifestyle and I really love it. I mean, there there are really hard times. This tour has been a grind, but the upside to it is I made a ton of friends. Everybody's super cool. Even if you're dragging your ass around all day long, you're having a great time. And ultimately, I started going to shows, particularly punk shows, because they were a ton of fun. You know, and what was it, your first gig? You remember? Oh, uh, I remember a couple of gigs, but just to to finish out my thought, it was like for me, even though Anti Flag is a, a very serious band in a lot of ways, when we put on a show, our number one goal is for everyone to have a good time, including ourselves. You know, I think the only difference maybe that we kind of really um, it, it, that we try to insert into our show maybe a little bit more than a lot of other bands is that we feel like it should be a space where all people feel safe. 
you know, regardless of whether you're straight or gay or black or white or male or female, you should have an equal opportunity to have a good time. And that is one thing that we really try to impress on an audience when we start. And honestly, I think that creates a vibe and it creates a show that ends up being a lot more fun in the end for everyone because you're not you're not having to feel self-conscious about who you are there you're not having to worry about you know is the pit going to be really rough oh no these guys told people like if you fall down the pit help each other out you know that really changes the mentality of a show where maybe some people in the pit are there to be macho all of a sudden i can see it from stage like i can see people chill out like in a way that just take it down to a place where it's like oh yeah i'm gonna do this in a way that's cool for everybody not in a way to prove how tough i am were there any shows early on then that impressed upon you that democratic almost approach to relating to the audience because yeah there's yeah. been different ages in the evolution of punk i guess when right. particularly back in the day when the shows were you know hairy and, yeah and well scary and violent exactly and, i mean i grew up in a inclusive. scene yeah yeah i mean i grew up in that scene you know where it was it was violent you know and it i, I think a big part of the violence was just that there was just a lot of the people on the scene were just unstable. I mean, punk is so much more mainstream now and you attract a lot more kind of mainstream type people. When, when we started playing, punk was really fucking underground. And And you had blue hair then, you were a fucking outlaw. Oh, total outlaw. (laughs) Total, like, it's amazing. Nowadays, you know, like your grandma gets a tattoo. Like back in the day, I mean, you got a tattoo if you were a criminal. Criminal sailor or, yeah, yeah, gnarly punk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like if you were the most hardcore punk, you know, like there was just a couple guys in our scene that had tattoos, you know. Are you you a tattooed man? Not at all. Not at all. Yeah, I just never had that much interest in it. It was like... Me neither. A big part of it was that back in the day, we were so broke. And, you know, if I I could, like, maybe save up to get a new guitar, which I really cared about and really wanted, or I could get a couple tattoos. So no brainer. It was a no brainer for me. Yeah. But I think back in the day, the people that were attracted to the scene were, myself included, we're so on the fringes, you know, such misfits. And I think that that attracted people with, you know, a personality that might be a little on the edge, you know, and it could be violent in that way. What happened in our scene and what we got really lucky with, there was a couple of things, but there there ended up being a core of people uh, who decided together that we wanted our scene to reflect some, an ideal that we had. You know, and we really wanted it to be a scene that was nonviolent. We wanted it to be a scene that was inclusive of all people. And, you know, we had some um, we had some role models like you asked about some of my earliest gigs. One of one of the bands, they were, it wasn't necessarily my earliest gigs, but it was a band that had one of the biggest influences on me was seeing Fugazi, you know, with Ian McKay from Minor Threat. Of course. Yeah. And, you know, I probably saw some of Fugazi's first gigs ever, you know, and they that was the attitude that they brought to to the show they they went on stage they took over the venue you know they set the tone you know there was no slam dancing at fugazi shows you know like because p- people might get hurt in some ways that was kind of a downer it kind of felt like okay the punk police are here on the other hand everybody got it you know because they were trying to make it about more than just uh than just being reckless they were trying to build something where people looked out for one another so we kind of took that into our scene and we had like this core group of people that were like you know we we want a scene that that actually helps lift each other up and so we actually got really lucky that we kind of came into a scene that wanted to be really positive and i think that Right about the time that was happening in our scene, it was happening in a lot of scenes because people were just tired of fucking horrible fights and like riot, pr- pr- like riots at shows all the time and things and like stabbings that. and yeah yeah I mean especially like in the New York hardcore scene type scene there was a lot of like really really ugly shows at that time you know and that was big in Pittsburgh you know uh, whenever I was not coming Philadelphia. Up. 
<laughs> not so Philadelphia. The other night, that was great. The other night he introduced us as being anti-flag from Philadelphia. PA. And then I was like, fuck, no, it's not there. It's Pennsylvania. You know, I'm overcomplicating it for myself. All the times that I've said the wrong city on stage <laughs> that I wish I could have back. Yeah. That was my moment. So you grew up in Pittsburgh. Is that where you grew up and came of age? Yeah, and Pittsburgh was a really interesting scene, too, in that you know, it was a, Pittsburgh was really working class steel town, and all of, most of the in, industry left when I was in high school, and so it became a really depressed town. I mean, the 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 a lot weight, of drugs, a lot of unemployment, tons of unemployment, probably a lot of alcoholism. Drugs what, drugs weren't such a big issue in Pittsburgh, but what was a huge issue was the population just left. Half of our population left in a very short amount of time, and it was just like a ghost town. Of, of really young people and really old people. You know, anybody who needed a job just left. And um, we have this thing in, in Pittsburgh. It's called, so our, our, our football team are the Pittsburgh Steelers. And the Pittsburgh Steelers in the 70s won four, four championships. And they became like the rallying point for everyone in the city. And in the 80s, when everybody left Pittsburgh, um, they so many people left Pittsburgh that there is now what we call the Steeler Nation, and it's people from all people from Pittsburgh that live all over the country, and really Pittsburgh is probably the most represented football team in America because there's so many people from Pittsburgh that live in other Everywhere. places, but yeah. they're still so dedicated to the team. So like almost every city you go to, there's a Steeler bar. And, it, and oh, it's like full on bars, like full proper on, communities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what's really amazing about it is it, it is a reflection of how devastated the town was whenever the steel industry shut down. And, you know, that labor history that we had there and then um, the working class history, Pit, you know, Pittsburgh was just an incredibly political town. And pretty much like about the time that, that we started Anti-Flag, almost every band in Pittsburgh was a political band. And a lot of it had to do with the labor issue in Pittsburgh. And it, it was beyond that as well, of course, because, you know, it was just a left wing town. So people had you know, that left wing politics was the labor was uh, in, included in that. Um, but so it was really interesting to me when I look back that if you weren't a political band in Pittsburgh when you started, you almost were just considered a poser band, you know. And it was interesting that when we finally started touring and we got out of Pittsburgh and we would run into bands that were like joke bands, like No Effects or whatever, we kind of looked at them and were like, these guys are fucking posers, you know. And it, it was kind of an interesting um, tone that was set in our in our city that our music you know the music in that town was really political but you know that when you look at when you look at what was going on in the town at the time you start to understand why why that was i guess it's that old adage of you write about what you know right and if you're a californian yeah. band yeah you yeah. know you're gonna sing about hitting bongs skateboarding <laughs> do you know what i mean it's kind of like you have to reflect the environment you're in and i think yeah. as long as you're true to that yeah then that's a sincere band whatever their context is well i, I right? agree i agree and then you know of course we got to know a lot of these bands and you realize like oh they're just like us i mean they're working to put on their own shows they're trying to build a scene they love playing music you know you realize you have a lot more in common even though what you're writing about are very different things but i agree it, it's like anything else if you do what you love it doesn't feel like a job Amen to that. Yeah. Although it can be hard work. It can be hard work, <laughs> but but there's much there's much worse work. So what was the direct impact on your family then in that economic environment? When was it like a tough time growing up for you as a kid? Were you sort of oh, yeah, I mean, deprived of the usual sort of, you know, luxuries that perhaps children sometimes enjoy? Yeah, I mean I think, you know, it's very Charles Dickens, you know, yeah. I mean and it's and and it's okay, you know. I I Do was, you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I mean, I'm the youngest of nine. Nine? So, yeah, Irish Catholic. Jesus. And, I think yeah. that might be the largest my, family I've ever... Like, you've ever interviewed. Yeah. <laughs> nine. Yeah, my parents took it deadly serious. Wow. And they... Uh, it, But it was great. I mean, it was chaos, but it, it was great. You know, we're so, we were like the Weasleys of Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Harry so, Potter. I mean, can you have close relationships with every sibling when there's that many? How does that work? I think because I'm the youngest, I do. You know, some of them got along better than others, and some of them didn't necessarily get along that well. But because I'm in the band, and a lot of them don't live in Pittsburgh anymore, 
I'm in contact with with everybody because I see everyone the most because I travel the most. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, you know, I think I don't think anyone should have nine kids. To be honest, I mean, it's that's a lot. Somebody's gonna get neglected because how can you realistically keep an eye on nine kids and take care of nine kids? Yeah. No, and my parents worked their asses and off. They both and worked full time. Yeah, yeah, they did, and they. They were really dedicated to the family and worked really hard. And I think when the chips were down and somebody really needed one of them, they were there. But, you know, I just don't think. And, and, and you know, when I look back, you know, that's part of the re- reason that, you know, when I look at religion and the way religion controls people and the way that religion pushes people to do things that are not in their best interest. I think I look at the Catholic Church and I, I think about people having nine kids because they think they shouldn't use birth control or they're going to go to hell and they think wow you know 21st century yeah you know what happened though is that the feminist revolution hit my mom found feminism and she i was the last kid and my mom left the catholic church you know and it it but it and that had a huge impact on the way i grew up and and the things that that i ended up believing in um but did you grow up with a distaste for the sort of established religions well i did because i was told from the day i could understand it that religion was evil you know because my mother you know and my father the the you know my dad grew up in ireland my dad's from ireland actually i have dual citizenship i have u.s and irish citizenship yeah good times yeah it is a good time i'll tell you yeah just (laughs) keep the goodness coming (laughs) but it's um uh yeah i mean i i I feel like, to me, honestly, when I look at religion, and I'm I'm perfectly willing to respect anyone's religious beliefs, or you know, whether whether they're 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 religious or not. But to me, religion just kind of feels silly. You know, I'm like, it, Santa Claus isn't real. What? Easter Bunny isn't real. What? Yeah, dude. <laughs> and it, you're bumming me out. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, buddy. Oh my god, I should have put a child disclaimer <laughs> on this. But it, it's amazing to me that people can disassociate from reality in that way, you know, and that they can accept that there are certain things that are not real, but somehow there's this other thing that's supposed to be real, or at least. Maybe if you you feel this spiritual force and you feel connected to a spiritual force in some way, I can almost relate to that. But what I can't relate to are the writings from a book that someone wrote down thousands of years ago to reinforce and, and, and that order. people and people are holding that as dogma. Yeah, and that to me it just seems a little naive to me, and I I have a hard time just from a just from a complete like a standpoint of just simple logic, I have a hard time understanding why people will buy into that. But the example that I do have in my life that helps me understand that are my mom and dad. And both of them will tell me, and they would tell you if you were here, that they were brainwashed. They were brainwashed from day one in the same way that people are brainwashed with nationalism in the same way that people are are brainwashed with, with many uh, with with, with many um, issues isms. of the day isms, thank yeah. you. So, um, but no, I, I so I was turned off to religion, even you know from day one. Really, it's one of those things, isn't it? It's like these age old fables that were designed to, I guess, give life meaning. In, sure, in a way, but and social all... structure. Yeah, yeah, but also to keep elites in power. Yeah, and you know now we have a new religion called capitalism, yeah, which well, keeps elites in power. Everything, <laughs> yeah, it? that really yeah. has like totally overshot. Yeah, anything that came before it. Yeah, and I, you know, I guess you're asking about my upbringing and what that was like to a certain degree. I mean, I, I definitely would go to school without lunch money, or you know, one of the things that Anti Flag does, and 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 I guess actually what I'm trying to say is I think that there's a silver lining to you know, even growing up poor and having it rough. At the time, it wasn't a lot of fun. But, um, you know, it it did influence me to care about the situation of other people, you know. I mean, when you go to school without lunch money or when you go to school in the middle of the winter without a proper jacket, you know, and it, 
it definitely helps you to have empathy for other people later who don't have a lot. And I think it also helps you to, to be grateful for what you do have. You know, I saw a really interesting um, uh, piece by a guy who traveled all over Central America in the 80s, and he just lived as people lived down there. He would live with people. And he said, you know, people in America and North or people in North America, Canada and America, they will never understand how much they have until they've gone to bed hungry for three or four nights in a row. You know, and it's, I never, luckily, like... And it bends I, if you're lucky, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I never experienced that, thank thank goodness. You know, I'm grateful that I never did. But it's, it, I, I, I do quite often, I mean, there's our society is so predicated upon keeping up with the Joneses and, you know, Oh, I have to have more. I see that someone has something that I don't have. And even though I have everything I need, uh, now I'm going to try to get this other thing that I don't really need. And I see people chasing that dragon all the time. And I, and I think, wow, you know, it's, it's a shame that people can't just appreciate what they actually have because so many people go without and travel makes that come home yeah like yeah. it really brings home sure. that idea of as you're saying be grateful for what you have understand yeah. the plight of others yeah and i mean i guess you get to see the world but in many ways a lot of the time when you're on tour you don't get to see that much of the actual communities that you're in do you try and like travel outside of touring do you try and make time during days off to you yeah know, see places like glasgow or, you know, if you're in Japan or South America, because you've got to get out there, right? Yeah, I mean, we do our best. I mean, it's expensive to be on tour. The longer a tour is, the more money you're putting out to be there. And you're paying people who are working for you. So it's, you know, people try to keep tours condensed and not take a lot of days off. And But but we, we do do that, especially if we're going to go somewhere that for us, it, it's a first time we're going there. Or it's a place that's more exotic, like you know, going to Indonesia or going to Russia, or or, or uh, Russia's wild, right? Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, um, I think that Russia never recovered from World War II. Yeah, you know, that was I was watching a documentary about Russia in like the early two thousands with my dad, and they they were showing how people were farming, and it was modern farming for Russia. And my dad said to me, that's how I farmed in Russia in the 1940s. Or excuse me, he's, he said, that's how we farmed in Ireland yeah, yeah. in the 1940s. He was like, they, they just never got beyond that because they bankrupted themselves with the Cold War and they never upgraded their industry for, for farming. And then, then the oligarchs came in and stole everything after the, the wall came down. So... It's such Russia a huge, is a, gigantic country as well. Like it must huge. be the most difficult place on earth to govern for that reason alone. Yeah, I mean it's a um, it's it's a fascinating place. I I love it. I've come to love Russia. I've come to love the people. I've been there probably six or seven times, um, and it's a lot. It, the thing that I find interesting about Russia and America is, as far as attitude goes and culture. They're the two most closely related countries, as far as I'm concerned, that I've been to because the height of nationalism that is there. The you know like there's a level of patriotism in those countries that is what I call corrupted patriotism or nationalism. You know, Oops, yeah, yeah, because and it's and it's really fascinating how the population is controlled as a result of that level of nationalism and how how even when they're being led into circumstances that are not in the population's best interest, their leaders quite often co-opt the people by rolling out that kind of nationalism. And, um, you know, I, I think it's really interesting right now when you, well, and, and, and just, again, you know, just another example of that is when you just look at the, the wealth inequality in the United States and Russia, you know, in, in the States, we have a historic wealth gap right now. And in Russia, it's the same thing, you know, but people just, they, they accept it and they keep rolling along with it. They accept the rollout of these wars, you know, and 
Um, I, I don't think those kind of things would be possible without that kind of corrupted patriotism that are in those countries. That it's just interesting when you travel around the world. Quite often, you just don't see the flag of the country you're in everywhere you go. In Russia and in America, you see it everywhere you go. And uh, there, there's a lot of similarities by, uh, uh, between those two countries. And also, though, the irony is that the people are great in both of those countries. Uh, you know, and it's, um, again, it's just it's another similarity that I find fascinating that these are two nations that were considered enemies for so long. And in a lot of ways, they're still total adversaries of each other. But... Uh, Total, but the, yeah. but, <laughs> but they're but they're really similar. It's an interesting point you make there because in England, and I don't want anyone who's listened to this to take offence, but the, the generalisation that I'll make is that in England, almost everywhere, if you see an English flag, it's very often a kind of super nationalist, often maybe racist. And I think that that's the case in most countries, right? You know, in America and Russia, it's, it's very it obviously different. relates back to the name of your band, which is just you know kind of. We're bigger well, than that, right? Well, Surely yeah, the world yeah, because be I to see beyond the. Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting, right? With the taking a knee issue in in America with the National Football League, and you see how that that protest started because African Americans are being killed at an unprecedented rate by police officers. There's a lot of African American players in the National Football League. They wanted to call attention to this, so they started taking a knee during the national anthem and saying, look, this flag does not represent me. People who look like me are are being treated very different. It's being caught on video camera. Nothing is changing. You know, we have so many examples of this now. Why is this not being addressed by our politicians? Something has to change. And what the politicians did is they immediately co-opted the issue they turned it into an issue of nationalism and that immediately turned the public against these players. Yeah. And, you know, they'll go out and worship these players on, on a Sunday. Now they hate them. And I, when, when this whole issue came around, I realized, like, wow, we were so dead on about challenging this issue of nationalism in America with our with our name. And I've I've always felt that patriotism to a certain degree. And I don't think it's totally wrong to be patriotic. I mean I've I love where I grew up. It's a great place and you know like the 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 definition of patriotism is a, is a love of of the place you live where you live where you come from which everyone should have a kind of a sense of roots yeah hopefully they do i mean hopefully they had a good experience there and hopefully it's something they relate to and it's a place that that they where they want to be you know and i I think that 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 that's all positive yeah that can be a positive thing but when it becomes corrupted then in the way that it quite often has been uh to turn people against their own self best interest um when it, when I saw this whole NFL thing go down, I realized, wow, we fucking hit the nail on the head. And I, the the reason more than anything that the name Anti Flag came about is because I was in high school when the first Gulf War was starting, and it was very clear to me that that war was going to be about oil, and that was it. Most Americans had never even heard of the Gulf at all you know like they it, forget like kuwait you know maybe a handful of americans had heard of iraq but you know all of a sudden they're talking about the persian gulf and that wasn't a place that was really understood by most americans it's it was a war that was certainly not going to make a positive impact in the lives of americans so why are we going there you know and i was i was a teenager i was in high school I could see that. And in the back of my mind, I was thinking if this thing drags out like a Vietnam and they'd bring a draft back, I'm at the perfect age. And a lot of my friends are at the perfect age. Furthermore, I lived in a city that was basically in a Great Depression. And guess what most of my older friends did? They joined the military. There was no other options. So all of a sudden, my buddies are getting ready to go to Iraq. Most of us had never heard of Iraq. And on top of all of it, 
when they started talking about invading Iraq, all of a sudden there were flags everywhere. It was it was like overwhelming and unbelievable. And it was so and it was amazing how with the news media and with uh, certain parades and events, how quickly people were convinced that this war was necessary. And I was a teenage kid and I could see it was bullshit. And that was that was when I decided I wanted to have a punk band called Anti-Flag. And here we are today. You know, I feel like with the NFL situation, I just think it highlights that as teenagers, we were very insightful for someone of that age to to be able to realize how dangerous nationalism is. Do you have any friends that voted for Trump? And do you, because obviously you're staunchly, strongly political. Yeah. Do you let politics interfere or even kind of interject with personal relationships what's your stance on that it's it's this has been the hardest one for me because um trump is so obviously a sexual predator a racist a bigot a xenophobe a nationalist you know and um i have a really really hard time with anybody who voted for trump You know, I stopped going to businesses that supported Trump because, you know, I I just think that when you support someone that is that openly bigoted and and just mean spirited, um, what does that say about you? You know, I mean, I understand there were certain people that I know who voted for Trump because they felt like the neoliberal politics of of the Democrats had left them behind. And I totally agree with that. But um, I couldn't overcome the idea that Trump is a racist and you are, with your vote for him, you're endorsing systemic racism. You can't say I'm not a racist if you voted for Trump. I mean, I think what a lot of people don't understand about racism, you can have a black friend and still be racist. You know, that's not the whole crux of racism. Racism is it's a systemic issue. It's the fact that there's a certain group of people because of the color of their skin that are discriminated against for the benefit of another ruling group of people. And so, yeah, with with Trump, it's been very difficult for me. You know, there's just certain people that I avoid and that I've kind of written out of my life. Um I've tried to have discussions with certain people. I think that talking to people is important, you know. That was going to be my next question is this. For me, a a readiness and a willingness to quickly in today's particularly internet-driven world. Right, right. To just, if someone disagrees with you, just shut them down, block them out, and only surround yourself with like-minded people who hold the same beliefs. Agreed. And that, for me, is very dangerous as well. Correct. I totally agree. I agree. And and I think that the dialogue is important. Yeah. And I've I've tried to have that dialogue before I've given up in a way. Yeah. You yeah. know, but the anybody that I would say like, okay, I just don't, I'm not gonna have this person in my life anymore. It was somebody who was on the fence for me anyway. Yeah, <laughs> you course. know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it wasn't well, like I'm saying as well. You've taken the time to try and understand their point of view, and you've gone. Actually, I'm still not on board with this. I'm talking more about people who just go. He just said something that isn't exactly in line with where I'm at, so he's out. Yeah. Like, there's yeah. a real kind of, that's, yeah. that's rife at the moment. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and I took Trump really personal in that I have African-American people in my family. I'm white. There's African-Americans in my family. There's, um, you know, our, our bass player is African-American people in his family. Our guitar player is marrying a woman from a Muslim family. I have a lot of very good Mexican friends, a lot of very good trans and gay friends. I mean, we know these people. Yeah. And how do you look them in the face if you support someone like that? Not only that, when you talk to them, they're scared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they should be scared because Trump has made the world dangerous for them. You know, I have Mexican friends who are as American as I am who get stopped by the cops now. You know, and, uh, you know, just in a way that they never would before. I have a friend who's Muslim who, you know, we have a line on the new record. The line is when I'm afraid of my name, I know that I'm not free. And again, this kid is as American as I am. Every time he goes to the airport, he's afraid. And, And he told me, he's like, man, I'm just afraid of my last name now. And that's just such a shitty way to have to live that you're. 
in you, the land of the free. Yeah, you know, and and so I took Trump very personal because I see how I see the the impact it's having on people, and you know, there there people in the refugee community, people in the uh, undocumented community, who are afraid to go to the police now if they have a problem, you know, if there's violence in their life that's happening, you know, it's like they're not going to go to the police because they're afraid of the police now. It, things like Charlottesville. Charlottesville wouldn't have happened without Trump, you know. And look, Obama, I was not a fan of Obama. I mean, you look at o Obama's drone program. Uh, you look at his sur surveillance, domestic surveillance program. Uh, Obama did not go after one single banker on Wall Street after the economic crisis. Um, so I have lots of reasons not to like Obama. I wasn't a fan of Clinton. Um, I think Clinton was basically Obama part two. Um, but uh, with, with Trump, it's it's a whole nother level of... Um, that he is bringing uh, kind of, of corruption and destruction and j in general just a blatant disregard for for people over profits and that's that's where I have a huge problem. What's the answer then, Justin? I know there is. Well, there one, is an there? answer. There is an answer, and, and it's great. I mean, it's it's interesting, right? Because. Because it's well, the wheel, well, isn't it? It's well, the continuous spinning of the the same yeah people and yeah. institutions and situations. And true, true. Well, I mean, we write these heavy songs, right? No, we're anti-flag and we're serious. Yeah, oh, yeah, we're yeah, really yeah, yeah. angry. Um, but the reality is, I'm actually really optimistic. I mean, we we're on tour with Real Big Fish right now, and um, after the Trump election. Uh, victory. We were, we'd we'd had a tour with Real Big Fish set up shortly after that in the states. So we went out, and uh, it it was amazing how many people came out to the shows, and after our set would track us down. You know, a lot of times we would go out to like the merch area and talk to people, and usually after the show we always hang out. So how many people would come up to me and say, "I was sleepwalking, I was apathetic." I didn't care. I care now. I'm awake. I'm engaged. You know, um, there were five days of protests in Pittsburgh after Trump was was elected, and you know, I think that the people wanted to give send a certain message, and it's the message that on our new record to me that's the most important message, which is the message of solidarity that. If you're one of the people that Trump is scapegoating, if you're one of uh, the people that's being persecuted right now, we're not going to leave you alone. You know, we've got your back. We're there for you. We're there to fight for you. We're there to stand with you. And I'm I'm seeing so many people coming out of the woodwork saying those things. And that gives me a lot of hope that if there's a silver lining to Trump, and this would really have to be a silver lining because make no mistake, Trump has done a lot of damage and a lot of harm to a lot of people already. And he's just gotten started. Um, but the silver lining would be that because of Trump, people are getting engaged. And I, and I believe there, there is already a huge backlash and that this backlash is going to continue. And, and what it does is it gives us an opportunity to not just go back to where we were with Obama. It gives us an opportunity to have some vision and move beyond where we were with Obama. So when you look in the States, let's work on health care for all people. You know, it seems like a novel idea over here, but in the States, that's a huge hurdle to get over. Um, let's talk about actual real gun reform so that we don't have a massacre every, every, all the time. Let's talk about reeling in our military so that we don't have military bases all over the world in places where we don't belong. Do you think that option is ever a potential? I do. <laughs> I do. In America, because that always seems yeah. to be the one for me. Oh, the gun one, you mean? The I'm talking about the military. The military. It's tough because the the military um, industrial complex, the military, the people who make weapons, their lobby is so strong, 
And, you know, it's interesting under Trump, you know, while he's tweeting about this and that and this and that, all these outrageous things. The biggest winners so far has been the fossil fuel industry and the weapons industry. He, the first thing he did was go to Saudi Arabia. What do you think he talked to them about? He talked to them about oil and he talked to them about a hundred and ten billion dollar arms deal. So that was the first thing he did. That sends a message, right? Um, so there, this that is a huge, a huge um, issue to tackle, but. The consensus with more and more Americans, especially after Iraq and Afghanistan, is that these kind of misadventures overseas by our military uh, and that the we- the amount of money that's being spent on the military and on weaponry um, is out of sync with what needs to be happening in our society. And I, I, I hear that message being expressed in places that I never thought I would hear it expressed before. But, it, you know, we have to keep in mind, though, you know, there's when you're working towards progress, um, quite often you fail and you fail and you fail and you fail and then you get a victory. And, you know, when you look at like a Martin Luther King, for example, or a Gandhi, you know, their struggles didn't they, they didn't win overnight. It took a long time. You know, it wasn't in my parents' lifetime. They lived in a segregated America. I mean, there were whites only water fountains. So and a lot of people thought that would never go away. And and how you know, how could it go away? It was so entrenched in our society. So for progress to happen, um, we have to believe and we have to keep working uh, towards change, even in even against the greatest odds, even when it looks the darkest, because we do have examples that, uh, with for example, the Berlin Wall, almost no one ever imagined the Berlin Wall would ever come down, but it did. And so we we have to to believe when it's darkest, it's always darkest before the dawn, and and we can't give up. When we are apathetic, when we're when when we're cynical, and when we give up, that's when we're gonna lose. So I. I luckily, I think because of my role in Anti-Flag, where almost every day on tour I meet these amazing people. I meet human rights lawyers. I, I meet environmentalists. I meet, you know, people who are are, are engaged in these struggles and, and people that we're trying to support with what we do. Um, those people give me a lot of hope because I realize there's a lot more happening out there than than is on the surface or that we read about on the front page of the of the paper. And for for all of these reasons, I actually see um, an arc where things have gotten much better. I mean, it's amazing to think about that, but in a lot of ways, things have gotten much better. Um, hopefully, Trump can springboard some of those kind of things uh, in in a way that nobody nobody imagined. And final question, I guess, uh, is where are all the punk records? You know, where are all the bands that should be addressing this stuff? Because I thought when Trump came in and all this, you know, just craziness reached its peak, well, I guess it's still peaking, that all these bands would, you know, new bands would come out, but also established bands would address it. And, you know, obviously you guys have just put out a new album that very much tackles it, but there's not many others I can think of, high profile or indeed exciting, or am I wrong? Am I missing them? (laughs) In a way... There, yeah, you know, it, it it takes time, and I think. Do you not think that, uh, and you can answer as honestly, sure. Like, do you not yeah. think that punk bands have a responsibility to talk about this stuff and highlight it, and not just tweet about it, like actually put it in their art? And I hope they will. I hope everyone will. I mean, it's because I think that, to me, the most important thing is having empathy for others and being able to put my, my, myself in someone else's shoes. I don't have to be a homeless guy to understand, you know, that it's hard to be homeless or I don't have to be a refugee to have empathy towards a refugee. And, and for that reason, you know, I kind of, those issues are important to me. Um, and I, I hope that those issues for the same reasons are important to everyone. I understand that, it's impossible to know about every issue. It's impossible to tackle every issue. And I think for, for asking people to do that is unrealistic. But I, I do think if people are willing to engage enough and be aware enough to the point that 
a guy like Donald Trump can't get elected, I think we're going to be fine. And and that that's what I would ask of people because I I understand that if you would try to you know, it feels so overwhelming to take on all of these issues. And and I totally get that and um but I just think being informed enough and again being engaged enough uh just so that someone really evil doesn't come into power. I think that, that that's important. As far as like where are the punk records and where is it at? I mean, I don't have an answer for you on that one. I think that people like to party and people like to forget all the bullshit that's out there because there's a lot of ugliness out there. And I can't blame them for that, you know? I'm not going to... And I, and I think we need everyone to do um, what they feel like, to, to make the art that they feel like they need to make so i'm not going to criticize people for not making uh, a record about donald trump right now or not writing a song about donald trump right now but i will say that i i wish people would i think that it's important and um i respect people that are actually willing to put themselves out there and have an opinion and say something because um i'll tell you like being in a band like anti-flag I know from experience it's a lot easier to be in a party band than it is to be in a band like this. And um, I'm not patting myself on the back for that. All I'm saying is that uh, I definitely respect people that are willing to have an opinion and and take a stand on things. And uh, I think when people begin to do that, that's when you turn the needle. You know, that's, that's when you move the needle. That's when things change. And uh, so it's definitely um, it's an important question, and it's one that uh, I'm glad you posed. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for a great chat, dude. Um, Wicked. Thank you for a great run of shows. Hell I love yeah. watching you every night, and I just think that it's been a you know a perfect bill that has both you know it has the party element, but it also has the engaged, conscious activist side as well. Comes back to what I said at the start of all corners of the punk box being ticked Uh, i'm with you man i'm with you and you know it's uh it's it's funny because uh people often say to me i never thought that anti-flag and a ska band would work but it does and And they've been coming out with you haven't they the rhythm section oh yeah 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 we've been having the real big fish guys come out we have a uh we got a we got a, so, a song on the new record with uh it's got a good ska feel to it and um yeah, so those guys have been coming out and playing on that, which is uh, it's a total blast. I love hanging out with the Real Big Fish guys. They're total class, and uh, they're a lot of fun to be around. And everyone on this tour has been great to be around. So um, we got lucky on this one. I will wait at the Brandenburg Gate, at the Brandenburg Gate.